sing. about Seenagers coming up. Seenagers is Saturday, this coming Saturday at noon. Where is Bob Smart? And is it a different spot? There, and it's not just for Seenagers. We call the group that because they've seen it all. But you know what? Some of us a little younger than the experienced folks in our midst have seen a lot too. So everyone's invited. We have chicken and drinks. And bring a side if you have one and you feel like fixing one. If you don't, it'll all work out. There'll be plenty of food. Hope you'll come and join us on Saturday at night. It's going to be wonderful. And uh, we want to remind our church folks, folks who are serving on the council and uh, elders and trustees, we have some meetings that are coming up in the next couple of weeks, so you can go ahead and take note of those. And then we have a special event that's coming up on Sunday, August the 11th. Uh, we're going to be hanging around after church, and we're going to have a little cookout. Uh, here at the church. Sort of how the Baptists do. Uh, it's sort of like how the Baptists do, yeah. No tent, no tent. You worship it in. You worship it in. That's how we do it. So. Exactly. We have a cookout. Who's cooking? Uh, well, actually, here's what we're going to do. Jeff, where are you? I'm, I'm, we're, oh, you're, you're heading back in there. So here's what we're going to do. The church is going to provide some stuff, and then a lot like the teenagers, we're going to ask other folks to help provide some so stuff. So the church is going to provide um, hamburgers, hot dogs, buns, and chips, and then... Uh, um, if you would like to bring a side, that would be very appreciated. So potato salad, fries, um, stuff beans. like that, baked beans, uh, salad, Coleslaw. for dessert. <laughs> yeah, anything you want to bring, and we'll have drinks, and, and we'll just have a really good time and, and, and bring back in the back-to-school season. Um, and we'll hope you'll be there. Thanks. Are we Thank bringing some school supplies? Yes, as a matter of fact, that's another thing that we're going to do is we're going to, while I'm back here, I'm going to adjust this sound system real quick because, you know, we do it all here. Multitasking here. Multitasking. We are. We're actually asking folks uh, in the next couple of weeks up until, you know, school starts on the Brenda, 14th. When school start? The children will be there on the 14th. I'm going tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> School starts for Brenda tomorrow, and most all the a lot of the other teachers too, and, and staff. Uh, but school will start with students on August the 14th, and we know there are some students whose families it's it's a tough time. Things are already tight, things are already difficult, maybe, and so we're just asking our folks to do what you can when you're out and about. Pick up some extra school supplies. Stanley was telling me yesterday that he found a place that has the the notebooks, the school notebooks, really, really, really cheap. It's almost buy one get one. So so just pick some stuff up, bring it in with you to church, and leave it in the fellowship hall, and we'll make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. If I can ask this really quick, and I am going to borrow you, Brenda, so I'm going to have to separate you and Cindy. I can already tell. <laughs> hey, what, what are like school supplies that, would, that are really go-tos that these teachers and, and well, kids need? you know, they're having those rallies on Saturday. Right. So my suggestion would be to call our family resources that we, you know, we do cut a tree out, we do Booker T, and to ask them because they get donations and they may be like low on this and high on that. That's probably what you and uh, Cindy were yes, talking we about were, when yes. I interrupted you, wasn't it? Yes, Miss Outreach and I were having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, you know, typically, the, higher th the harder things to get are, are markers and the things that are a little more expensive, dry erase markers, markers, things like that. Um, so. We'll do that and we'll communicate that to, to all of us about uh, what we need, okay? We'll put it on Facebook and we'll get it out Absolutely. there. Absolutely, we'll get it out there. Be sure to join us. Plan on hanging around with us on Sunday, that August 11th fun. for uh, the Maybe cookout. Maybe we'll sing or something too. We'll yeah, we something. may, we may. 
We may. Wake the neighborhood up. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we're still encouraging folks to bring your straws in as we TerraCycle those. Get them out of the waste stream and do something useful and helpful with those. And coming up tomorrow, actually, is also a, a very special day in our country. Rita? Well, tomorrow is Earth Overshoot Day for the entire world. And this is the day on which the people of the world have used up all the natural resources that the earth can possibly replenish for the entire year of 2019. That means that from July 30th to December 31st, we are using water and land and trees and crops that cannot be re regrown. Uh, it's just beyond the earth's ca carrying capacity. So we are robbing from our children and um, leading to extinction of these resources. And in the early 1970s, up until then, sustainability and consumption were in balance. But nearly every year since then, the date of Earth Overshoot Day has come earlier and earlier. Um, there's more information about this on our green bulletin board. Uh, Mason Bishop and I are the green team of the church. And, uh, so. We put up things on that bulletin board. And I'm also putting out the bamboo toilet paper in the Fellowship Hall. And you've heard my shtick twice before that 27,000 trees are cut down every single day in this world to make very soft toilet paper from virgin timber that's used for about three seconds. <laughs> um, bamboo is totally sustainable. Please buy it. Uh, if I'm not close by, just put a dollar in the change box and take a roll. Super. Thank you, Rita. Thank we you, Rita that. and Mason, Kenny's husband, who are continuing to increase our awareness about the earth and the environment, friends. It's a really serious thing. It's so, right so. up here on our banner where we be the church one of those things is protect the environment we want to uh, remind folks that our services are now available via podcast on apple Podcasts and google podcast the other day i was in the kitchen and i said hey google play the latest podcast from bluegrass united church of christ and it did just like that so okay. you can do that on the google and the alexa it's also a great way to share our church with folks to send that or just send them a text or a link and say hey go listen to this absolutely google's the only thing in my house i can tell to do anything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at bluegrass no one stays hungry and today we have spaghetti is that right jeff World famous spaghetti from Jeff, and if you're hungry, or you know someone who's hungry, or you're going to be passing someone who's hungry, pick it up and hand it out the window. There's also a food bank in there, so if you need just a little extra to get through the week, or you know someone who does, just pack a bag and take it home with you. And there's some fresh vegetables in there today as well that Darlene and Bonnie brought in, and so uh, I told Darlene to direct Brenda to the table for cucumbers and tomatoes and yeah. peppers and stuff. But Help yourself to that. Thank you all for sharing that bounty with us. Yeah, it's like a farmer's market in there. It is. Let's take a deep breath. Breathe in the air that God has gifted us with. Hold it in. Thank so grateful God. for this day. Amen. Let's sing. This is the day. This is the day when God's spirit. join together in our responsive call to worship this morning. <coughs> Gathered we come, some of us lost. God comes to us. Gathered we come, some of us hiding. God comes to us. Gathered we come, some of us joyful. God comes to us. Gathered we come, some of us anxious. God comes to us. Gathered no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. No matter where we are on our faith journey, gathered. 
God comes to us. Let us pray. God of presence, help us to acknowledge you in this place. Calm us. Calm our worry and our thoughts. Help us to feel you in the music and in the song and in the word. We come, gathered to know you in deeper ways. Thirsty for living water. Guide us to streams of wonder and glory that we may drink and be filled. We pray all this in your many, many names. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we sing our opening hymn, Open the Eyes of My Heart.
It's the heart and the spirit. So as we gather on Sundays, we find this place to be that of a family, even if today is your first Sunday with us. This is a place that is safe and loving and supportive, and that even when we leave these walls, having listened to one another's joys and burdens and things that keep us up at night, we take those with us, we remember them, and I personally, and I know the other pastors do as well, but my time is in the morning outside after I've let Winnie out. And I have this list with me, and I always lift these things up during that particular week. I do want to thank you as we think about joys and concerns. I want to thank all of you for this time away, for your understanding that I coordinate a lot of my Sundays off with Brenda's schedule. I was telling a couple of our visitors uh, once August hits until usually the following May, Brenda and I sort of pass each other in going and coming through that school year and church year. So it's always a good time for us to get away. We had a wonderful time. I missed you all. I kept in touch, and I thank Kenny and Pam. Pam asked me at the beginning, do you want to get updates or you want to check out? And I said, no, I'd like to get updates. And so they were so good at that. So thank you all. And Brenda, I've thanked her via text, but I want to thank her publicly. And friends, I want to thank you. I want to thank the leadership of this church, the council, the elders, the trustees, because things just kept, kept on keeping on. In fact, I think we added a couple of members. So uh, if I think we need to grow the church, maybe I'll leave again for five weeks. <laughs> but it was truly wonderful. I want to thank all of you. Uh, our pride presence was just, even from afar in Florida, I was just beaming with pride. And that particular day, I had a rainbow swimsuit on, all right? <laughs> But I was beaming from afar and so very touched at us providing communion with folks. And I heard some of those stories and they were just amazing. And I know a lot of you have taken a lot of your time and energy to be present there and with other things. And the week prior to that, when we had our special stuff here at church, I'm still getting texts and calls. And I know Pam and Kenny are too about that when we did, you know, For the Bible Tells Me So movie. And we had Dr. Lisa Davison do that. Uh, so... It's just wonderful to be back, and it's wonderful to know what an incredible congregation this is. God comes to us on summer night in baby's breath by firelight. God comes to us. So grateful God here we are here we are in your presence and we know that you come to us and that you draw us near so holy God we we give you thanks for this church here at bluegrass we've heard folks express it we see it in one another's eyes the care the authenticity and we ask, oh God, that you continue to lead us in ways that we can minister one another and love each other. And God, help us to move outside these walls and doors to folks who are yearning to know perhaps a different message of your love, a new interpretation of what it means to be your beloved child. God, we thank you for times that we can be with spouses and partners and friends and family to enjoy to just take one another in to take nature in and remind us how precious those times are and how precious this earth is for we want to leave behind our legacy footprints and handprints that we were here and oh God, we want to leave behind an earth with this beauty that we also enjoy oceans and mountains and streams and valleys and deserts and all in between. 
God, we're thankful for celebrations of birthdays. We're thankful for Stacy's next turn around the sun and for what she means to our church and the joy that her husband Jeff has in sharing this journey with her. We're thankful for Pam and Mike who'll celebrate 26 years and even in the best of marriages we all know there are some give and takes and there's a lot of commitment to stay connected to one another. And as we remember these birthdays and as we remember these anniversaries we know there are folks here that continue to think about folks aren't here anymore to celebrate birthdays or anniversaries but we thank you that we miss those folks because that means we love them so and so when we love and even when we lose you are there and we're grateful we pray oh God this morning you'll be with Ron as he's at the hospital and we're thankful for his friendship of Brenda God, we continue to just be in awe of Teresa Brown's positivity and going through this aggressive cancer. So God, touch her heart this morning. And touch the hearts of her kids and let them all know we love them. God, be with Richard as he goes to be with a family member going through a really tough stretch. So be with him as he travels and as he's present. We continue to pray for Michelle as she has finished radiation but still has some after effects of that. So be with she. God, we're reminded by Bob and Daniel of folks among us who are addicted. In truth, we all have some addiction. But these addictions of alcohol and drugs... Wow, what an effect they're having on our world. A missing mom with young ones. Parents who are unavailable and grandparents struggling to step in, and that's hard. So God, we pray for those battling addiction. May we look in their eyes not with judgments, condemnation, but with compassion and care and grace for by the grace of God there go I God we lift up Bill's ex in the Philippines as Bill there in the Philippines battles this dementia many of us in this church family have had family members and friends and it is a brutal disease so be with Bill and his now partner. And God, while we celebrate this new life that's in the womb of Dee, we pray that you would continue to be with her and give her strength. And we look forward to little Kennedy being here soon that we can wrap her in our arms and love her like we do Reagan. God, we pray, pray for Patrick. We're thankful that he's thus far been able to have the strength for this chemo, but God continue to give him that strength. So we pray for Patrick and Keith and all of their family. God, we pray this morning for those in our church family who aren't with us. Maybe they're traveling or maybe they just needed a Sunday morning break. So we pray that wherever they are, whatever they're doing, they know we love them. We can't wait to see them again. And we're thankful for those here who week after week show commitment of time and resources and creativity because they believe in who we are as a church. And so as this family gathered here right now, oh God, we're just going to take just a minute to lift up to you silently what's on our hearts. God, thank you for loving us just as we are. We are grateful. Amen. God come to us on summer night in baby's breath and fire. God comes to us on a summer God comes to
is good, friends, to be back with you. And particularly, it is good to be back in the pulpit. Now then, I did watch the services while I was away, and I took note of a few things. <laughs> First, uh, Pam and Kenny seem to be relieved that they can take a breath of sorts from writing sermons every other week. <laughs> but wow, oh wow, did those two bring it these past five weeks. Yeah, clap, they did. How lucky we are to have these two capable, passionate, spirit-led, spirit-fed pastors. I am humbled and honored to serve with you. And second, this came from not from my viewing of services, but rather my continued Facebook stalking of you all. And Daniel, you're the one I caught last week. I saw where Daniel invited folks to come to church last Sunday to to listen to him sing the what we now call your song. We know Elton John has a song called Your Song, but Child of God is Daniel's song. Yeah. And again, wow, oh wow, oh wow, you all got to share what Kenny and I heard months ago in the studio that blew not just us away, but musicians and background singers or whatever. We went to church and still do every time you sing that, Daniel. Now that said, my brother, in your invitation for folks to come to church last week, you put out another little carrot to try to bring folks in, and that carrot was that Pam would be preaching. And I was really fine with that part. It would have been a good carrot, but you brought attention to the fact that Pam was not a long-winded preacher. <laughs> hands raised. And so, um, Kenny, I'm, I'm not sure what that says about you. <laughs> I'm thinking, though, that, uh, that Daniel's post might have been directed my way. <laughs> Daniel, we were on the beach, and I said, Brent, listen to this. <laughs> and her reply was, brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> and in truth, she reminds me of that every Sunday on our way to church. <laughs> anyway, I just do want to note that I've just spent about 300 words on this welcome back Thanksgiving introduction, so if you have your stopwatches on, stop them and you can start my sermon time now. <laughs> this morning we begin a new worship series that we've developed called Hits and Misses. Now, it might seem that I'm a huge baseball fan. That's why we chose this thing. But the truth is, it stemmed from three sources. First, I was very moved by our Becoming series and how Pam and Kenny especially really brought that into our spiritual lives. Second, as I was in the grocery store in Florida during our first week there, I kept finding things that were out of place. And it wasn't by the mistake of the workers who were stocking the groceries. Instead, it was just some random things that customers decided they didn't actually want to buy. So instead of putting them back where they got them, that was a concept I learned fairly early in my life, and there was some consequence if I didn't follow through. But these folks would just put things, I guess, at the point they decided not to buy it, like this one. Who put strawberries with office supplies? Who does that? At any rate, this misplacement of products seemed to occur over and over again every time I'd go to the store. And when I'd find things, especially if they required refrigeration of sorts, I'd either take them to the front as I checked out to have the staff restock them, or I'd take them back. So this idea of things being misplaced started this simmering in me, which came to be this worship series. And I've warned y'all before, y'all know I find theology everywhere, even in grocery stores. The third thing that sprouted my thinking about this series and the themes we'll dive into came from what I believe to be God's Spirit speaking to me. And sunrises with Winnie in my lap as we waited to see how many sea turtles would find their way to the sea each morning. In my and Bren's daily five-mile walks, where we had that special 90 minutes to savor the beautiful views and the diversity of people we'd meet, 
and we talk about anything and everything, including this worship series, wombed in me, just waiting to be birthed. And so here we are in the next several weeks, we'll give some thought to hits and misses. For it could be said that life can be a hit or a miss, home runs or strikeouts. And for some, and many of our cases, misses seem to outnumber the hits. So during this series, we will examine some of the most interesting characters and lessons in the Bible and how these misses were transformative, <coughs> misplaced, mistaken, misgivings, misunderstanding, misfortune, misjudged. <coughs> So friends, I hope you'll join us for as many of these Sundays as you can. And uh-oh, I'm now at over 900 words of an 1,800-word sermon, so i got to get to it here. Restart your sermon stopwatches, because here we go. Now then, as much as I'm all about how all of us and our environment are in this dance of sorts, I'm not as far leaning left that I believe strawberries have feelings. <laughs> And yet, because these strawberries were misplaced, it sure brought some ideas and feelings to the surface for me. I wonder this morning, have you ever felt like you're only a number in this great big world? I mean, we pull numbers when we go to Baskin Robbins, if it's a busy Baskin Robbins. Not that I've been there a lot in my life. <laughs> Or we hear numbers at food counters when our order is ready, like I did, for instance, this past Friday morning at the grocery there in Florida. And in truth, we know that some restaurants now will ask us our first name instead of calling a number. And I usually love to give them the name of somebody I'm with or somebody I don't know just because I don't want them to go, Marsha, and I come up and get this huge sack of food. I do give credit, though, when anyone or any organization seeks to personalize our waiting by calling a name versus our number. In the grand scheme, though, friends, does anyone here but me sometimes wonder if you are only a number, if your life really matters, if your challenges are noticed or important to anyone other than you and especially to God? Well, it seems like our faith ancestors in the ancient community felt this way. For when we read these holy stories that ground us in our faith, indeed in our lives, it seems like there's a lot of similarities between them and us. And in this case of just feeling like a number, and even at that a misplaced number, it appears like ancient folks needed to hear otherwise. What do you think? If someone had 100 sheep and one of them wandered off, wouldn't he leave the 99 on the hillsides and go and search for the one that wandered off? If he finds it, I assure you that he is happier about having that one sheep than the 99 who didn't wander off. In the same way, my God who is in heaven doesn't want to lose one of the little ones. Pam just read one of Jesus' teachings through parables. And now Jesus did this a lot, friends. That is, he taught through parables. Meaning not directly, not like a history book, not with clear facts, not with a lot of instructions of right and wrong. But he taught in these parables, which means they give different meanings to all of us. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, I didn't grow up thinking like that. I didn't grow up thinking I could actually read or listen to these stories and discern what they might mean for me. No, my preachers told me about these parables, but they did the interpreting for me, for all of us. Like we were just numbers sitting in the pew, and their job was to tell us what the meaning was. I hope we never do that here at Bluegrass. For one of the big problems with going about church that way is folks get misplaced and overwhelmed because that interpretation is pretty narrow. So they wander off from the church, perhaps from things more important, maybe even God. 
And here in Matthew, Jesus uses the analogy of a sheep. Well, why? Because in the ancient community, sheep were pretty important. In fact, any livestock was important. And to most observers, livestock were more important than women because the number of livestock one owned in large part determined the social status of the man. See, women and children had no social status, and God knows there's still work to do on that angle of life. So Jesus knew that if he tried to teach a lesson using sheep, folks were going to sit up and listen. And he knew if an owner or a shepherd lost even one sheep, they'd go looking for it. Even if they had 99 left out of the 100 they started with, they'd go looking for the one. Now in the last verse that Pam read, in some interpretations it talks about, and it says it this way, in the same way your Father in heaven is not willing to let any one of these little ones perish. Well, I got that one interpreted for me. And it meant no matter the church I was in or the preacher I was in and those more conservative theological churches, this last line was the line they used to begin the altar call. <laughs> Because the crux of the story, they said, was that Jesus was telling folks they needed to be saved. Maybe so. But since it's a parable, and Jesus intended for us to read it and study it and listen to it and then come to what lesson each of us might learn, apart from someone else, here's what it means for me. Today, next time I read it, high likelihood it might mean something different. I'll be at a different place in my life. It'll have another meaning. But here's what I hear. God's pictured here as a shepherd and has this extraordinary concern for every single one of us as sheep. And here the number's a hundred, but it's just a story. God has this extraordinary care and unmeasured grace and unconditional love for billions of us. Every single one of us and that gone at every single one of them. When I read this parable and specifically the last line, I hear that God doesn't desire one single person to be left out of the circle. If you ever wonder about our logo, it's an open circle by intention because it's never going to be closed to anyone who wants to be a part of us. God created us uniquely for a purpose that if we work hard enough to discover that purpose and then have the guts and the courage to follow it, we can live a life beyond our imagining as a church and as individuals. Our challenges beyond our heartache, beyond our loneliness, beyond our fill in the blank. Oh, it may sound cliche to say God cares. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but in the deepest valleys of my life, I've held on to not just that hope, but that promise. It seems like our ancient family needed to hear this kind of lesson more than once. Maybe they too would find themselves feeling lost or abandoned or without a home. A home family. A home in the literal sense. A home community. Maybe they too felt like they were misplaced in a scrambled, chaotic, fast-moving world. An important lesson is worth repeating. We heard it from Matthew, and now the writer of Luke does just that. Jesus told him this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and places it on his shoulders. When he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Or what woman, if she owns ten silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Celebrate with me because I found my lost coin. 
In the same way, I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. Well, friends, like many other stories in Scripture that are retold by a separate writer, Luke's version of this lesson is similar to Matthew's, except here with this lesson, Luke adds to the parable. It's a real problem for folks who say they take the Bible literally. <laughs> It's no wonder that out of all the gospel writers of Mark and Matthew, Luke and John, Luke is my favorite. Luke's writing and interpretation of the gospel message, he's trying to appeal to the common folk. And I'm pretty common. So we hear Luke repeat this parable teaching, but did you catch a couple of key differences? Jesus talking in first person, not like Matthew who Jesus invites the first lenders to imagine a person who owns sheep. But here Luke has this first person. Jesus said, suppose one of you. In other words, it's about us. Not some imaginary friend. And then in this beautiful moment, we not only go looking for someone who's abandoned or lonely or pushed to the side, when we find them, we joyfully pick them up and carry them on our shoulders. And we bring them home. And then we call our friends and neighbor, and the scripture says we stand with the rejected ones across our shoulder and shout, Rejoice with me, I found her. Seems to me to be a clear call. At times in my life when I'm strong enough and things are going pretty well, I need to pick up my sister and my brother and carry them. Especially if it seems the majority of folks or a bunch of church rules or society rules or political rules have shut them out. Other than the intentional weaving of our beautiful diversity, I believe that God doesn't see skin color or nationality or faith tradition or who you marry or what your culture is or borders. Rather, God clearly gives this lesson, this mandate, friends. Hey, look around and see someone who needs to be picked up and pick them up and take them home and then call your neighbors and your friends and invite them to celebrate with you and your new found friend. Because maybe, just maybe, at some point, we're going to need a shoulder to ride on or a shoulder to cry on. Luke didn't finish with the parable. He adds even more to the lesson. He shifts just a bit and shares a parable teaching from Jesus about the woman with the lost coin. Now, i got to give my brother Luke credit here for doing something few of Scripture writers do, and that is using a woman to teach us a lesson. But he has her doing house cleaning, Pam, instead of preaching. <laughs> Women in the ancient community were really busy. They had a lot on them. Tending to kids, households, servicing their husbands. Not even counted in the census. Hmm. The role of women, the degradation of their contributions, the census debates have been going on much longer than we thought. I digress. This busy woman takes time to look for one single coin. And did you catch it? She lights a lamp to look for it. It's not like putting a switch on. For in the ancient community, lamp oil was valuable and not to be wasted. So she uses this valuable commodity to look for one coin, and like the shepherd, when she finds the lost coin, she calls her friends and neighbors, no cell phone. So she goes and finds them, and she said, look, I found my coin, risking judgment and ridicule, and downright, this woman is crazy. Because she's valuing something that others think have no value. Perhaps even herself. Because she knows that God loves and values every single human being. 
And finally, Luke adds some repent language to both the sheep analogy and the coin. You all heard it about those sinners like us. More conservative, literal claiming preachers have used this parable to call again for folks to be saved. Repent, in the literal sense, means to turn around. So when I read this story this time, I hear the possibility that not only can we learn here the importance of bringing overwhelmed, anxious, lonely, grief-stricken, confused, outcast brothers and sisters home, but sometimes they, sometimes we, go in hiding. And sometimes it's justified. Yet if we're too big or too stubborn or too set in our ways or too fearful to be picked up on someone's shoulders, we might have to make the decision to come out of hiding, to turn around, to have a change of heart, to have a change of mind, and to begin the journey home ourselves. I stayed away from church for seven years. And the truth is, other than the Mormons and a Baptist church close to me, no one ever came looking for me and knocked on my door. God and I had something going on at that time. And I decided to come out of hiding and try to find home again. And God, I'm glad I did. Stepping into a church when we've proclaimed for years, I'm done with church. Or maybe including a person or a group we've long judged to be less than or the other. Maybe coming out of hiding means that we start valuing ourselves as much as God does. Here in Luke, there's this beautiful dance, this reminder and lesson that every single one of us is loved, no more and no less than the other. And this powerful transformation of who's in and who's out. That whether we are the lever or the levy, whether in the life game of tag we're it, searching for our missing comrades, or whether we are trying to find the best place to hide, we have a role in our life, friends. Go searching for those who need a hand up. And if that's us, turn towards the light. Turn towards the love. The person or church or group that's willing to take us in and pick us up and be joyful about it. Whether we find ourselves this morning lost, or whether in truth, even though we're here, we're hidden a bit, God's calling us to wholeness. And wholeness in a real sense can occur until all of us, all of us, have a place to call home. May it be so. In my home growing up, we learned a whole lot about each other at dinner every night. Breakfast was a bit different. Folks were going all different directions. <laughs> Bless you. But it was important for us to gather as a family at the table. And there were times that my friends would come and eat. Maybe their mom was working a second job. My mom did, but she, start, she typed for a court reporter long after we'd gone to bed. Maybe there were other circumstances. There were some friends that came to our house because there wasn't enough to eat at their house, but I didn't know that for years. They'd just say, hey, can I come with you and eat? I found out later it's because their family's pretty big, and you know their parents were like, don't you want to go eat with Marsh? <laughs> <laughs> a table. 
we come to this every week. And it can become a habit. But my prayer is, at least for me on this day, that we see this for what it is. <laughs> this unconditionally loving, grace-filled, grace-giving God that says all of us are welcome. And somehow I'm going to try to take a piece of bread and a sip of juice and remind you how much I love you. And remind you to come out. Come out and be who you are. Here's the strength. I'm the strength. Let's sing that faith. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of peace. Come to the table of peace. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of peace. pray for God's blessing. Oh God, how blessed are we to have a table that extends and extends and extends and there's always one more leaf to put in. We thank you for this cup and for this bread. And some days, oh God, it is just wonder bread and grape juice, but on today, let us take it and meet you there at the table of love and grace and joy where there's always room for all of us. Amen. The night that Jesus would be with his disciples for the last time. We gather around this table mindful of all that was going on in that room. Wow, wow. Doubt, confusion, anxiety. Folks who believe with all their heart in what he was doing and saying and folks who doubted and betrayed and denied. He knew all that. <laughs> Just like he knows all of us. And yet he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks and he, he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he said to all those gathered, take this bread and eat it. my life, who I am, what I've taught you. Jesus was born and he died as a Jew. And it was his Jewish tradition to take a cup. Can you imagine how heavy the room was that night? By the time supper was over. Self-reflection, questions maybe, tears. Knowing all that emotion, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, I want you to share this cup. I understand all that you're feeling. I understand it's different for each of you. But here's my promise. I may be going away physically. This 
morning, friends, no matter who you are or where you're on life's journey, whether you can't count how many times you've taken communion, or you never have, or you have sometimes, but you maybe went to a place and said, you got to have things in line before you take communion. i got to tell you, friends, there would be very few weeks I'd be taking communion. Wow, how's it feel to say, you know what? Just like you are, Marsh, today. Whatever's going on, I got it. Take this bread and this cup. Acknowledge that. Feel in your bones. So you're invited to take a piece of bread and then after a time of meditation to drink from the cup. As we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen I brought you a present. Winnie and I brought you a present. Brynn helped a little. I brought you a seashell. Do you realize no sunrise is the same? Every single one of them are different. And every single seashell is different. It's amazing to me, really. And so they're all different things in here. There's some rocks and there's some things that looks like a shark tooth. I don't know what it was. But I'm going to pass these through as Brett plays something. And as I do, just mingle around there and find something that speaks to you. Maybe you think it's perfect. Maybe it's one that's got a chip in it or maybe whatever. But I want you to take one of these with you. And I want to invite you during this series to hang on to it, put it somewhere, maybe you'll see it every day. And let's use these as our anchor 
as we talk about hits and misses. Take your time mingling around. Well, I shouldn't have started with payments. While the basket is making its way through the congregation, I want to say again how wonderful has it been to have Brett with us this morning on the piano. It's a joy and a treat to have you, and we miss Brenda when she's not here, but I'm telling you what, you're, we enjoy having you. Uh, and I'm glad that we're going to give Brenda another opportunity to uh, take advantage of a, a Sunday for herself. You know, there are a lot of ways to give here at Bluegrass, and these are just some of the folks, actually, who uh, kind of show up and, and help from Sunday to Sunday today. Of course, Brett on the piano, Keith, and I should probably mention Billy and Stanley and others, too, who get here early on Sunday morning. I, this, I can't uh, beat them here. It's, I, it's, I, I thought today for sure I'm going to beat them here at 8.15. They're here. Oh, and, and uh, <laughs> it's an hour drive each way for Billy Metcalf to be here, but he's here every Sunday, and he makes sure these slides and everything are operating. And I'm the one who builds the slide deck. And I have to tell you, sometimes I just mess it up and I don't get it right. And Billy catches it and fixes it for me so I don't look so bad. Uh, so, and we want to thank all of these folks. I was in here yesterday. Brett and I were in here working on music yesterday. And when we arrived, Stanley was here. And he was cleaning the church. And he was here most of the day yesterday. So, Stanley, we want to thank you. And, of course, Deb uh, serving hospitality today. Uh, and all of the diaconates, and uh, Jeff with uh, Nosh, and Seth, of course, and the, all the trustees. And then I, I want to mention, when I pulled in here yesterday, and I looked at this yard, and I thought, it's amazing. wow, I put in today. it's absolutely beautiful. So we want to thank Edmund uh, for your hard work, and Joey, and Keith, who uh, also worked on it. They didn't just cut grass. They trimmed it all, and they got weeds out of the flower beds, and, and all of them. They spent a lot of time on that. And some of you may not be aware, but there's a house right here next to us that it's my understanding it's, it's a home for... Uh, women veterans. Women veterans. Mm -hmm. And we uh, promised them when they first moved in that they weren't going to have to worry about maintaining their grass and their property and things like that. So we've just added that to our mowing. So when we cut the grass and everything here, we go over there and we cut theirs and trim it and take care of it too. So we want to thank everyone who gives in so, so many ways. This is the Christ candle. And believe it or not, Jesus does not come in and fill it full of oil. <laughs> uh, 
Billy and Keith and folks like that do that. So we want to thank them. And we want to thank you for all of the ways that you give. And of course, this is the way we keep these lights going and all of those things. So we thank you for what you give. And God, we ask you to take these gifts and bless them and use them in ways that honor you and remind this world of how beautiful you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. to say one more thing very quickly. I meant to mention it during the, uh, the when we were thanking folks to invite them if they would like to serve. We have sign-up sheets in the fellowship hall and we're always looking for folks who can help us serve as diaconate and uh, especially with things like nosh and hospitality mm -hmm. on Sunday mornings. We, we would love for you if you're interested and helping us out with those things on Sunday morning, that would be wonderful. So well, we've had a few that. folks sort of overloaded with that. We have, like, we've, so. we have. We've had some folks who stepped up every Sunday morning that there's an opening and they've taken care of that and we would like to close up those openings. So if you're interested in doing that, we would appreciate it. There's a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall. We're also always interested in folks who want to become part of our family. And here at Bluegrass, it just means at this point in your life, this is where you want to call church home. This is where you want to covenant with us to be part of the family that we journey in life together. If that's something you'd like to do officially, I would love to meet you here, Pam and I, and Kenny even over here as he's leading singing, to just come up and share with us you'd like to be a member of our church. Let us sing together the summons.
It's my thrill this morning to welcome Sam and Carissa into our congregation. They've got a little good news to share, but I'm going to share it for them. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, um, Sam was sent on a little scavenger hunt. And one of the stops on the scavenger hunt was right here in this sanctuary. And we met here and we prayed together and then we found a clue and she went on her way and at the end, she was proposed to. Very good. So I suspect there will be a wedding coming, but we are more than thrilled to have you here, to journey with you in your faith, to share your joys and your pain, and your mama's gonna kill you for not having her here today, probably. <laughs> so, so welcome, welcome them at the it's door. It's a thrill, let's welcome them officially, friends. Billy, will you just go back to that previous slide? This was our blessing. Will you love the you you hide, if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around? Through my sight, my touch, my sound in you, and you and me, will we? May it be so. They're going to go to the back with this pain. Let's roll. 